May be seated. Amen. Little barbecue, come on up here, sir. And Mark's going to preach for us. I want to have a time of prayer for him and his family before he does that. And I want you to share a little bit about your ministry uh, before you preach for us about what you're going to be doing. Um, this is your third trip to Italy, isn't it? Yes, it is. So it's getting familiar. <laughs> Just don't get too comfortable. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Let's, let's pray for the Martins. Lord, I thank you for Brother Martin and his family. Lord, I thank you for Sister Debbie and the children, Lord. And we just pray that you'd be with them. We pray that you'd give them safe travels. Lord, we still need support to come in for them. And Lord, we pray that that would come in, all of it. All the needs that they have would be met. Lord, we pray that you'd use Brother Martin as he ministers there in Bible Baptist Church and Sister Debbie with music. And Lord, all that they are able to do there, we pray you'd guide them. We pray you'd fill them with your spirit. We pray you'd use them as tools in your hands to do your work there needed for that church in the absence of their pastor. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd bless the children Lord, the challenges of doing school abroad and, and Lord, uh, just missing friends. And we just pray that you'd bless them and help them. And Lord, help it to be a growing time for everyone, mm. including us as a church, as we miss them and as we pray for them and support them and encourage them. Lord, help us all grow through this time. As we do your will, as we're yielded to your spirit, that you would be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Appreciate you very Thank much. You. Thank you for it. Yes, sir. Naples, Italy, our third trip. And uh, we are very excited to get back to Naples. Uh, we do military missions, and so typically when, if, if we were ever to return to a military church, there's nobody left. Because they rotate and they change duty stations, but not so in Africa, I mean in uh, Italy. Uh, there's Africans that have been part of that church since we were first in that church back in 2012. They're still there. And uh, so it's neat to go back and see them and, and, uh, and really rejoice with them and, and just minister to them. They're wonderful people. And, and uh, so we just like the military ministry and this aspect of that ministry is... Is a, it's a wonderful blessing. It's a reward to get back and, and see some faces faithfully serving the Lord uh, through all of the things that they have to endure there in Italy. They have a tough life. It's not easy for them there. Uh, but they're faithful. Oh, what do you want to know about what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you how we got the phone call. Uh, we've been praying all summer long, just... Uh, we got back from Naples, I mean, uh, uh, where were we at? Japan. Don't even remember where we've been. Uh, we got back from Japan last spring, and we had to cut our trip a little short because of the uh, virus, and, and so we weren't sure what was going to happen with this ministry and when we'd ever have the opportunity to travel again, and, and, uh, and if somebody asked, would we really want to travel in a pandemic, and, and uh, the answer to that is, well, we didn't really want to, but I'm not about to say no to the Lord. If the Lord opens the door, we're going to go through it. And so we were asked about six weeks ago if we could come out for the last part of this year and uh, fill in that church at Naples, and, and uh, we said yes. I says, how do we get there? And the missionary didn't know. He didn't have an answer for that. What he told us was, I don't know, I hope you can get here because we need you. And uh, Italy, even today currently, is closed to 
uh, tourist travel. So no Americans traveling there to do touristy things are allowed in their country currently. And we do travel with a tourist passport. And so to travel on a tourist passport and actually have business, you know, we, we weren't sure how to balance that and how to justify it. And uh, so we had kind of left it hanging from about six weeks ago until two weeks ago. So it was about a month that we said, yes, we'd come if we can get there. And about two weeks ago, I was talking to our mission board, and they suggested they could send us a certified letter stating the business in which we would be there in the capacity of missionaries serving this church and BIMI uh, is our representative. They, they certified that that, uh, that is our business. And so they mailed it to us. I received it. And so we went ahead and proceeded to buy plane tickets. So earlier this week or was it last week? Debbie bought plane tickets. Last week. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> See, I don't even know what day it is. Uh, and so, yeah, we've had our plane tickets for a little over a week now, and uh, uh, we've, we, we, you know, it's, it was hard putting a plan together at the last minute. We knew what we were going to be doing, but, uh, you know, when it finally comes down to, all right, we've got to set these days in motion, and so we want to be there on the 1st of October. That's the goal, and so we'll leave here this afternoon down to Boise. We fly out of Boise to D.C., Spent a couple days there, and then on to Naples, Italy. So the big question now is, will Italy allow us in? We don't know for sure. We're praying that we will, and I would appreciate prayers on your behalf, especially on Wednesday when we travel. Uh, we want it to be all prayed up and everything prepared and ready so that when we land in Naples, the right guy on duty is behind the immigration office, and, uh, and all he has to do is put us a little rubber stamp and say, enjoy your time. And that's what we're hoping for. So uh, please pray for us in that aspect. That'll be Wednesday. Don't forget. Okay. Anything else that I should cover, Pastor? Is it? Yeah, I, yeah. It's it's it's. I think it's a nine-hour flight from D.C. to there. So it'll it'll be same day. Um, I don't, please. And whether we're off by a couple hours, God knows anyway. Whether you pray early or pray late, if you pray, it all counts because God makes it work, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else? We'll be back just before Christmas. So. Uh, we're going to miss the uh, Thanksgiving meal here, but we will have one over there. The Italians don't celebrate Italy, I mean uh, Thanksgiving, but the Americans do. And so we're looking forward to that. I want to look at Jude today. That's where we'll be preaching. You ever think it would be nice if you could see the future? I was thinking that when I was just telling you this about our flight. If I knew for sure that we could get into Naples, it would sure get rid of some worry and, and fretting, wouldn't it? <laughs> because the last thing we want to do is fly all the way to Italy, spend all that money and time, and have Italy say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come in. You've got to go home. Uh, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to see it. So I wish we could see that ahead. Uh, but, you know, isn't it by God's mercies that we can't see the future? Because think of it like this. If you could see everything that was to take place in your life, what would you be successful at? <laughs> You'd quit trying. You wouldn't be successful at anything. And so, uh, it is by God's mercies that we can't. We wouldn't be able to handle so many things that are going to come our way. Uh, how many challenges when you start into a challenge and you think, how hard can this get? Uh, did, you know, what is this going to take? How much money is this going to take? Uh, how much effort am I going to have to put into this? If you could see how much it was going to cost you, 
whether physically or financially or any other way, would you finish it? I dare say most of it probably wouldn't. Uh, we'd, we'd quit. So it's by God's mercies that we don't see those things. But I want to tell you this. God has given us a very clear look at the last days before Christ comes again. And we find this in Jude. There's some other areas in the Bible that you can go to and you can see a picture. But God describes what life will be like in those last days before he comes again, and I firmly believe that, that we're in those days. I also tell you that 2,000 years ago, they thought they were in those last days. So as far as we have come, who knows, maybe there's that much more to go. It's by God's mercies we don't know, though, isn't it? Most certainly. But here's a very clear look at some of the things. I'm going to just start with two verses. If you would look at me with Jude, verse number 20 and 21. Stand with me as we read these two verses, please. God's Word says this in verse number 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this afternoon. What a privilege to be in your house and, and even to be living in these days. So many trouble and, and things that just don't make sense and things that are just tearing our, our nation apart, tearing our churches apart, tearing our families apart apart and so many things seem to be working against even your word and but Lord you're in control you know what we will experience and I thank you for your word that there is still hope your word has given us such great hope that no matter what this life might cost us we can be faithful and you'll be there with us through it all Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and experiencing your salvation, experiencing your friendship and grace. Lord, I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Why, our nation's a mess, isn't it? Oh, my. And in the book of Jude, we see some things that are very clear about the last days before Christ comes again. And so we're just going to uh, skim through some of these verses. If you back up to verse number 4, you're going to see, it says this, For certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, un, listen to this, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And can't you see it today? Men of our own nation turning the churches of God despicable in the face of our nation. Defaming God's word. Oh, we see these things. It most certainly is happening they use God's grace as an occasion to blaspheme, to commit regular and blatant sin. It's happening right before our eyes. We see these things happening. Here's something else that's going on. If you skip up to verse number 7 and 8, it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them, can you imagine seeing Sodom and Gomorrah in those days? the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh and, uh, excuse me, strange flesh, and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Here's what's happening in, a con in our nation today, fornication and every vile affection has become accepted. We see it, don't we? Filthy dreamers. Those who would rebel against all that is good. 
and they have believed a lie. You know what lie they believed? Our schools have been teaching it. Our judges have been proclaiming it. That God isn't real. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says this, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Oh, and they have believed it? Let me challenge you not to get caught up in that lie. I believe creation is real. I believe it was a literal six days of creation. Oh my goodness. Verse number 11 says this, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. I want to address those three names. The way of Cain. Who was Cain? He was the brother of Abel, right? And what was it that Cain did? Murdered his brother. In Genesis chapter 4, it says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Here's what the anger had uh, generated from. And, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The way of Cain is this, that rebellion, hatred of religion, envy, despising a brother. <coughs> Can we see that? In those who are rioting in the streets of Portland, rebellion, hatred of religion, envy, and it led Cain to murder. That's the way of Cain. 1 John 3.15 says this, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. The hatred of Cain led him to murder his brother, and it's prophesied right there in the book of John. Jesus likened hatred to the same thing as murder. Be careful who you hate. Who does God hate? No, he doesn't hate anybody. Oh, no. See, he loves everybody perfectly. He doesn't love any of us more than anybody else. He doesn't love us in this church more than those that are outside the church. And he doesn't love us any more than those who would never step foot in a church. He loves them perfectly. God absolutely loves perfectly. Pastor Umber was talking about the wonderful thoughts this morning that God has towards mankind. They're wonderful thoughts, more than the sand of the sea. They're good. They're precious. That's how God thinks of us. And his warning is this, don't go in the way of Cain. It's okay to hate the sin. It's not okay to hate the sinner. See, we ought to be praying for those sinners. Because, by the way, I am no more than a sinner myself. I have experienced the grace of God. I thank God so much for it. His forgiveness is more precious than anything else because it has saved me from eternity of torment. It has reunited me with God the Father. And because of that one day, I can sit at the feet of Jesus. Can you see it? I can see it. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Just enjoying those moments. But it won't be moments though, will it? No. No, it'll be forever. Yes. The way of Cain. God warns us not to go that way. He says then in the error of Balaam. And what do we know about Balaam? Who was he? Well, as the Israelites were leaving Egypt. They were coming up towards the promised land and there was a 
There were some people there, right? And Balaam was hired to come and prophesy against the Israelites for great reward. I will give you all that you have ever wanted. And, it's, and what did Balaam do? For gain, he came, but his curse was turned into a what? A blessing. It wasn't a curse at all. But you know, there were some other things that Balaam did. See, he taught the Israelites to sin against their own God. The error of Balaam is this, which have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Let me ask you this. Do you love God more than anything else in this world? What if you were offered a great sum of money or some other wonderful thing that you just can't even imagine? It'd just be, this would be the best thing that could ever happen to me if I just forsake God for a moment. Maybe just, just one day. God warns us not to go after the error of Balaam. You know, what were the Pharisees doing? They were corrupting the word of God for their own gain. And I challenge you not to corrupt the word of God for your own gain, whether it's monetary or any other advantage. And then there's also the gainsaying of Korah. And what do we know about Korah? Who is he? Well, it's spelled a little differently here in the, Old, or the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. But Korah was one of those mighty men of the Israelites. As they left uh, Egypt, he was one of the princes of their tribes. I believe that he was, uh, was he in the tribe of Levi, Pastor? I didn't look that up. Do you know? I think I'm thinking that he was in the tribe of Levi, and he is one of their princes. And in Numbers, it says this, Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he stood against Moses and Aaron. And so here is the gainsaying of Korah. He contradicted the authority that was God-given to Moses. He caused strife and rebellion in the, in, the, uh, in the tribes of Israel. Does anybody know what the riots in Portland's all about? <laughs> I think somebody's gone after the gainsaying of Korah, thinking they're going to gain some advantage by sending somebody else to do their dirty work and cause trouble and <coughs> excuse me and contradicting authority rebellion i don't know what they're all about but i think it has something to do with that i think we can see what's happening in our nation today in those three verses right there or those three men that were just named even looked up to verse numbers 15 and 16. It says, Ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers. Do we have any murmurers in this nation? Complainers? Walking after their own lusts. There's some names that come to mind, and I'm not about to name them. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Listen to this, it says, ungodly sinners, ungodly committing, ungodly deeds. I think it meant ungodly, didn't it? Murmurers. Those are smack talkers. Slaying the reputation of the righteous. I'm not looking forward to the next few days as they run the name of the new 
Supreme Court Justice nominee through the mud. You know, I'm sure you can imagine some of the things that's probably going to come out and be spoken about her. Complainers. Unwilling to defend the righteous and walking after their own lusts at the expense of the righteous, thinking themselves to be something. Let me ask you, are we something? I like to brag about some of the things I've done and accomplished. I like to brag about some of the things that I've I've accomplished in my life and and where I've been. But I'm going to tell you, uh, it's all vain. You know why? Because it wasn't done for God's glory. And who am I before God? I'm like that little ant. You know, Brandon. I don't know where he's at. He must not be in here right now. Oh, he's next door. We were out on a concrete slab one day, and there's a bunch of little ants running around, and, and I says, hey, Brandon, watch this, and I stomped on one. And he just thought that was the coolest thing, and he went out stomping all those little ants. <laughs> they certainly didn't deserve to be stomped on, but they got stomped on. And it was a fun game, and so every time we're on a concrete slab, we'll stomp ants. And I'm telling you that I, I'm no better than that ant before God. I don't deserve any kindness or goodness from him. I don't. I could never earn it. Pastor mentioned that this morning. You cannot earn any favor from God. He only gives favor because he chooses to give favor. He's only kind because he chooses to be kind. He is good to us because he chooses to be good to us. He saves those who just recognize that hand of goodness by accepting His name as Lord and Savior. He chooses to. He certainly doesn't have to do those things. God has given us a picture of what life will be like in those last days and we can see that it's a plain picture. But that's not all. There's some more things here. Verse number 17, it says this, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers, walking after their own lusts, giving no regard to God whatsoever. And they would ridicule those who do name the Lord God. They hold the Bible and His Word in contempt. You know, there's a movement to erase any religious history in this nation to remove the landmarks. Verse number 19, it says that they would separate themselves. Boy, we see some new factions popping up, don't we? We see a lot of disunity in this nation. And those that would separate themselves are never in agreement with God's righteousness. And they don't consider one another in love. It says they're sensual, wickedly indulging every lust and passion that comes to mind or passes by the eyes. And boy, isn't it rampant in this country. And God says that these things should never be named among His people. Let me ask you, are you sure you're part of His people? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Fulfilling the lust of the flesh. You know, that's Satan's desire. He wants us to fill the lust of the flesh. He wants to pursue every ungodly deed that we could ungodly commit. 
That's what He wants from us. Having not the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And, and I will say this, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there are some things that you cannot understand out of God's Word. It's beyond your comprehension. You cannot even get a grip on it. It has to start at salvation. You have to have the Spirit to understand spiritual things. Now, I'll tell you, before salvation, I had a spirit that was dead. Is there any understanding in dead things? No. But at, at salvation, what happened to my spirit? It was revived. It was brought to life. Jesus Christ breathed life into it. Yeah, and it has some understanding. It has the capacity to understand some spiritual things now. There must be some spiritual growth. And the Bible says that those that are walking after their own lusts, fulfilling those things, have not the Spirit. Why should it surprise us that a nation who has turned its back on God is falling apart and pursuing under all these ungodly things that shouldn't pursue. It surprise us at all, should it? Why should it surprise us that character has been thrown out the window and replaced with rebellion? Integrity is gone and replaced with vile affections. Righteousness not even longer considered because self-indulgence is much better. I'm going to tell you, there is great hope. There is so much encouragement in God's Word because though He paints a pretty ugly picture here, He finishes it with some hope. And we read those verses Verses 20 and 21. Let's go back there one more time. Revelation, I'm sorry, Jude. Verses 20. It says, but beloved. Who is the beloved? Oh my, the children of God. Do you know Jesus? Are you part of that beloved group? I'm telling you, most heartedly, I am and I enjoy it. Beloved. Building up yourselves are you washed in the blood and build yourselves up there is great hope there is some encouragement there's some things to look forward to there is still a cause there are people out there dying to hear the gospel they got to hear the gospel do you have that urgency in you to get the gospel out to let that testimony of Jesus Christ, which he gave us, he put right here a testimony that it has to shine out. Are you letting it shine? Or do you cover it up? I'm going out these doors. I better cover this up. Let it not be so. It says... Beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. The author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ himself. Are you leaning on him? Do you trust him? Really, no. Do you trust Jesus Christ? I can tell you verbally, yeah, I, oh yeah, I trust God. You know, the proof of how much I trust God is what my walk looks like outside that door. My tithes and offerings will speak loudly about how much I trust God, more probably than anything else, won't it? Because what's most dear to us? I like money. I don't like to just throw my money around. I like to hang on to it. That most holy faith. Mm. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It goes on to say this, praying in 
the Holy Ghost. Who's the Holy Ghost? The third person of the Godhead. And where is that Holy Ghost? He's right here. He's right here. You know how long he's going to be there? Until I get to heaven. <laughs> Once I get to heaven, I won't need him here. But until I get him, until I get there, I need him here. Oh my. I don't just want him there. I need him there. And I'm going to tell you, there's days in my life when I, I, I think, you know, if I could just push to the side and, and not have to have the, all that conviction about sin and unrighteousness. You know, can I get away with anything? <laughs> I'm going to tell you this, you quench the spirit long enough, you won't feel that conviction. Don't quench the spirit. Let God reign in your life. Let the Holy Spirit speak loud and clear. Clean out the wax. Trust God. Romans 8.26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. I didn't know Marines had those, but evidently we do. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Let me tell you how dear the Spirit is to me. He not only is here and comforting me and guiding me and, and speaking kind things to me and encouraging me and, and helping me do the right thing. You know, he's praying to God right now on my behalf. He's speaking to God in ways that I can't even understand. I don't know what I need. I think I do, but I don't. I know what I want, but I don't know what I need. The Holy Spirit knows, oh, so much better what I need. And he is right now pleading, Lord, provide. Send some comfort. We need some encouragement right here. We need a reward. Answer this prayer. Whatever it might be, the Spirit is asking and pleading right now. Not just for me. If you know Jesus Christ, <laughs> He's there. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. How do you pray in the Spirit? You know, I have a Holy Ghost, praying for me. But see, I, I, can, I can pray with using physical attributes, and, but you know, it takes a little more faith to pray in the Spirit though, doesn't it? Because although I don't know what I need, and sometimes I don't know how to ask what I need, I can certainly pray by faith, Lord, give me an answer. Help me with this. If I have the attitude of praying by faith, that's a great help. You know what another help is? Look at verse number 22. It says this, and as some, I think I, I missed something here. Verse number 21. We're still in verse number 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Well, let me ask you. Did you start your day off in his word? <laughs> did you spend any time communicating with God the Father? Did you pray in the Spirit this morning? Do you continue praying in the Spirit throughout the day? Do you work on a relationship? Do you trust God? Are you obedient to His Word? Are you doing what God has called you to do? 
I'm telling you, there's great hope and great expectations that we can have from what God will do through his people. If you keep yourselves in the love of God, look at it again, verse number 21, it says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, looking for the mercy, don't you like mercy? If you like grace, you'll like mercy a whole lot better. I like getting things I don't deserve, but I certainly like not getting things I do deserve. Because what do I deserve from God? No kindness at all. I do deserve His anger. I deserve His judgment. You know, all these things are a choice, though, aren't they? These last days that we looked at, we can see plainly it's happening in our nation. I don't know when the last day is going to be. But I don't want to be caught not ready. I want to keep myself in the love of Christ. I want God to continue calling me beloved. I like it when Debbie calls me. Sweet names. I don't think she's ever called me an unsweet name. Isn't that a nice thing? <laughs> she's precious. And God is so much, so much more precious. He calls us beloved. A term of endearment. Do you talk to God like that? Do you talk to God like he's your friend or some distant God? He's our friend. And we have some great things to look forward to. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are your eyes focused? Are you looking to God? Are you looking up? It's only by grace we receive it. Mercy. If you want mercy... You've got to pursue mercy. And we don't have to look in vain, do we? I want to close with one verse. Hebrews 11:6 6 says this. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking the Lord? Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this afternoon. And as hopeless as the world might look, Lord, you have given us great hope that nothing can take away. Though everything that I enjoy and trust in in this world and in this nation and in this state be taken away, you have still given me the promise of heaven and oh how much better that is. I love you. But Lord, I need to pursue you Help me do that. Help me to love you with all of my heart. And for those areas that I, I just don't have that kind of faith, Lord, help me. The Bible says, help thou my unbelief. Oh, oh, what a precious question that could be proposed to God. Help thou my unbelief. Don't you believe if you ask it in all sincerity it will be answered. What greater thing to ask from God? So whatever areas of life that we struggle in, that you're facing right now, it might be tough. Ask God. Help thou mine unbelief. Thank you so much for your kindness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.